thanks so much for the invite to, to talk. So today I'm going to be looking at uh, anti-DL4 VNR target nanoparticles. So super catchy title. So why would we look at DL4 then? Uh, two seconds here. Cool. So uh, DL4 uh, is what we class probably as an underexploited target. So as we're all aware, there's a need for novel uh, treatments across a range of different cancers. Uh, and one of the potential avenues of doing this is by targeting the LL4. Uh, so this is a, a notch one ligand necessary for the production of the appropriately branched vasculature, uh, which tumors then utilize as part of their angiogenic strategy. Uh, higher DLL4 expression uh, also tends to be prognostic for factors such as uh, tumor stage, size, uh, and invasiveness. Uh, DLL4 expression is found in a number of different cancers, including breast, uh, gastric, colon, and prostate, as well as pancreatic, as we can see here. So, as you can see uh, in PDAC cancers, we see a 50% positivity level for, for DLL4. And importantly, in pancreatic cancer, which is a very stroma rich tumor, uh, we see DL4 expression in both the tumor cells themselves uh, and in the associated stroma. On the right hand side of the screen, then you can see uh, what you get when you preclinically block uh, DL4. And this is found to induce excessive sprouting of vasculature, as demonstrated in these chick uh, retina fluorescence images. Uh, so, once you get this hyper sprouting, this vasculature is non functional. And so, this likely contributes to an inhibition of tumor growth. So what are we going to use to target this then? So we're looking at using a VNR, which is a potentially novel targeting uh, ligand. Uh, so despite having evolved around 400 million years ago, sharks possess uh, an adaptive immune system. Uh, and as part, of this, as part of this, they possess an unusual protein class known as these IGNRs. Uh, the most striking feature of with, which is the fact that they lack uh, a light chain. Uh, so the region we're looking at in particular is the VNR region, the variable domain. Uh, and so one of the useful features, I guess, is the fact that these are single chain domains. Uh, they can be reasonably easily expressed uh, in bacterial systems, uh, which I guess is handy because you don't really want to be uh, immunizing sharks, tackling sharks in general uh, very often. Uh, I think if we've done anything from Jaws, Sharknado, any of those, that's what you don't want to be doing. So sort of key that you can express in bacteria. So one of the, I guess, main features of these, which is useful, is their uh, outstanding stability. So in the center here, we can see uh, the uh, VNR chain, their binding activity. Uh, this is after four weeks, a range of different pHs and temperatures. So these are super, super stable. And then the very far right-hand side, a comparison uh, between signal and chain fragment variables and uh, and the VNR, and you can see across a range of temperatures, they're super stable. So we've got more than structurally on the VNR. So uh, they have similarities to the classic immune goblin folds. Uh, they have these CDR1 and CDR3 regions. And then they've also got these other two domains, HV2 and HV4, uh, which are so-called because of their similar in structure to TCRs. Uh, so if you look at their size then compared to fab fragments, um, IDTs at the bottom. They're really, really small, but despite that fact, they have these four binding loops. Uh, I guess one of the most interesting regions uh, is the CDR3, where and if you have a non-canonical cysteine, you can get really, really extended uh, binding loops. And these are sort of predisposed to bind uh, sort of hidden clefts and receptors, uh, which conventional uh, binding molecules like antibodies won't be able to bind to. So that's something that we'll touch on a wee bit later as well. So why would then these be good to stick on the outside of a nanoparticle? So they're small, so you can potentially get high surface loading. As we said before, they're tough, so that stability could be of use during manufacture and storage and administration. As well, they're amenable to, to engineering, which again, we'll touch on in a second, which is handy for conjugation chemistry. Uh, and they're also really, really strong uh, binders so down to sort of the pico molar range. So uh, to start off with, we made our nanoparticles. So these are PLG peg um, malamide nanoparticles. And as this is a non-conference, people like to see sizes and stuff. So this is DLS, uh, NTA, and SEM of the particles. So you can see nice size and really monitors first as well. So we touched on the 
amenability for engineering for conjugation at the start. So our VNARs have been engineered with the C terminal cysteine. Uh, so this free cysteine uh, at the end of our VNAR allows us to conjugate to the malonide on the outside of our parallel. And because this is the only cysteine available for conjugation, we're going to have uh, oriented attachment of our VNAR to our particle so it's going to be in the right orientation to bind to, to its cognate receptor. And this is the case. So this is a comparison between our anti-DL4 VNAR, which is called E4, uh, and 2V, which is an isotype control. Uh, so firstly here in B, uh, this is a comparison using a fluorescent elisa-based method. So our nanoparticle is loaded with the fluorescent dye, uh, rhodamine in this case. Uh, our DL4 is mobilized on a lysa plate. Uh, and you can see there then it helps in the binding uh, potentiated by the, the E4 VNAR. Uh, and this binding then is also backed up by SPR data in, in C there, so biocore uh, data. Importantly as well, this conjugation that we're seeing is definitely dependent upon the malamide on the outside of a particle. Uh, and indeed this malamide approach uh, is beneficial to enhance the binding effect. So this is a comparison between malamide and NHS chemistry. So the standard carbon diamide NHS chemistry will bind to lysines randomly uh, situated throughout the VNAR, whereas our malamide approach, as we said before, is uh, site specific. Uh, it's going to be uh, orientated so that our, our VNAR is in the correct orientation uh, to bind to the receptor. And you can see in B then using this fluorescent elisa based method again, the enhancement of activity uh, with similar levels of conjugation uh, that you get with the the malamide approach as opposed to random NHS chemistry. And again, this is backed up by SBR data. And then just in E, you can see that as you increase the percentage of malamide within the particle, you get increased binding, which is what you'd expect. So just again, showing that this is, the conjugation is dependent on the malamide. It's not just uh, sticking randomly to the surface. So we moved on then and looked at these in some cell models uh, and the LL4 positive cells. Uh, so firstly here, this is in a range of uh, PDAC cell lines, the MIA packet 2s uh, and PANC 1s. So initially we looked to see that these were definitely DL4 positive. Hopefully you can see that by Western blot uh, and flow cytometry. And then we just compared uptake of fluorescently labeled nanoparticles uh, in the bottom. So E is the MIA packet 2s, uh, F is PANC 1s. And you can see enhanced uptake of our E4 conjugated particles in red over our isotype control 2V. We also looked at these then uh, in endothelial uh, cells, so these are Fuvex. So initially we upregulated our DL4 expression uh, by uh, stimulation with FGF and VEGF growth factors, and this is sort of a standard method for uh, increasing DL4 expression. So again, we looked at uptake of uh, rhodamine loaded particles and C back in focal microscopy. So you can see an increase in uptake of our E4 conjugated particles over new nanoparticles. Uh, and then in DNA, we've loaded our particles with uh, a standard chemotherapeutic CPT. Uh, and you can see a reduction in viability uh, of our targeted nanoparticles in comparison to our non targeted particles. So that's indicating enhanced uptake and then enhanced uh, cell death. And this is both at 24 hours in D and E is 40 hours. So finally, then we looked at whether these VNRs have a, a functional effect, I guess. So we've shown that they can allow us to enhance targeting uh, to DLL4. But once this is binding, is it actually having any functional effect? So again, we did this in a HUVEC model, so a standard tubulogenic uh, assay. So to upregulate DLL4 in this instance, we kept our cells in hypoxic conditions, which again is proven to enhance DLL4 expression. Uh, so firstly then, if we look at B and C, uh, you can see that with our uh, E4 nanoparticle in comparison to our NID nanoparticles across a couple of concentrations, we see a reduction in total mesh area, which we're using as a readout of uh, tubulogenic formation, I guess. So I know what the first question is going to be afterwards. It's going to be, you said you're going to get hypersprouting, and this is the exact opposite of this, and that is the case. So this is a bit of a weird result, and we were like, what's happening here? So uh, as I say, if you Classically, if you're going to block uh, DLL4, you get this hypersprouting, whereas what we're seeing here is we have multiple branch points, uh, but the vessels themselves don't tend to extend. Uh, 
And the reason for this is, and we've looked at this later, although I haven't shown the data, is that our VNORs bind into a completely different epitope to what standard antibodies bind to. And this is something that, as I've said, that they're predisposed to. So you're getting this completely novel uh, uh, biological effect, which is really interesting. So that sort of uh, I guess highlights the potential for using VNORs because of their, their weird sharky biology uh, and the fact that they can potentially have different effects to what we would get with conventional, uh, conventional therapeutics. And then also super importantly in DNA, we see that our nanoparticle itself is having an effect on this. So the nanoparticle scaffold is improving the ability uh, of our VNR. So we're getting an increased uh, or enhanced effect with our E4 when it's conjugated to the nanoparticle as opposed to when it's free. Uh, so yeah, so that's good rationale for using our nanoparticle, even in the absence of entrapping something within it. So just as a really quick summary, so we've showed that by using uh, VNARs and PLJ nanoparticles, we can have control conjugation, which allows for enhanced uptake into DL4 positive cells, and then also enhance functional activity. Cool, so I'd like to thank everyone who's been involved in this work, uh, probably Chris, Michelle, uh, and Adam, our collaborators at Elasmogen for uh, supplying the VNARs, uh, all our funders as well. So thanks very much. Thank you, Peter. That's really interesting. And I think that's the first time I've ever heard Sharknado mentioned in a scientific talk as well. Hopefully um, not that. <laughs> so um, we... Yeah, we're, uh, yeah uh, we're waiting for a couple of questions. We've got one come in, and it's actually something I was also thinking about. Is I was intrigued to see, Peter, that you saw an increase in size and polydispersity when you when you modified with the, the VNAR fragment. So. What do you think was the the cause for that? Do you think it's just the increase in size, or was was there some aggregation of the nanoparticles on that functionalization step? Yeah, so I think generally it is just the increase in size. Uh, I think there potentially is uh, a slight amount of aggregation. That's something we'll probably have to address further down the line. But I think generally it's just an increase in size with with the amount of contribution there. Mm. Did you? I mean, in terms, did you look at any TM to try and see if that was? I mean, obviously TM associated with drying effects anyway, but did you see any evidence by other yeah, we haven't done Sorry, we haven't done TM on these yet, but that's something we could definitely do, like, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, okay. Yeah, um, we've got another question um, about what, what, did you look at the mechanism for internalization of nanoparticles? Uh, is that something you've, you've started to investigate? Uh, no, we haven't actually looked too much at the actual mechanism, so I guess it's uh, we're fairly confident the L4 mediated uh, active receptor internalization. Uh, uh, the mechanisms up beyond that we haven't done so far. I guess initially we we're looking at whether it was being uptaken and whether we were seeing a functional effect with that. But I guess now's a good time that we know it is actually doing something uh, and has that sort of benefit to go back and explore the biology of that further. Uh, I guess it'd be important to see how that affects. I guess receptor be section and stuff as well. So well, that's cool. Okay, and got um, I got one really quick question myself. Uh, what's what's kind of the next steps? Do you think to move this towards kind of clinical use? What what's the what what, what do you have to do next? Yeah, so I guess the next, our first step initially would be to look at some in vivo models. So I guess up to this stage, it's mainly been uh, in vitro based. So. Uh, I guess mouse models in the first instance, uh, some stuff on biodistribution, I guess, would be useful as well to see how these are, uh, are behaving. Uh, so that would be the first step, I think. Fantastic. Cool. Thank you, Peter. Thanks for a really interesting talk. Well